It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program writer for The Nation magazine, proprietor of edgeofsports.com, and author of his latest, Brazil's Dance with the Devil, the World Cup, the Olympics, and the Fight for Democracy. Dave Zirin, welcome back to the program. Oh, great to be here, Sam. Thanks for having me. So, Dave, I mean, get, uh, you know, you are, I mean, I say, I say this every time you come on, but it, 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 it bears repeating. You are... Uh, the best, in my opinion, uh, writer about how sports is so intertwined, not just with our society, but our politics. And um, you you really lift the veil of what's going on underneath the, the surface of the uh, of what fills the uh, sports page of our newspapers and uh, uh, media across the board. And um so, but let's, why, why Brazil? Wow. I mean, Brazil, it started for me looking at Brazil because I've been writing about the Olympics and the World Cup for years. Um, and here's Brazil getting the 2014 World Cup and then Rio hosting the 2016 Olympics. And when you couple that with the fact that Brazil, of course, has been for some time a rising economy competing on the global stage, now the fifth largest economy on the planet, it seemed like a book that would be fascinating to write, to actually travel down to Rio, go through Brazil, and see how the planning was going on. Because I've seen it in all these locations, the ways in which the debt builds up, the way uh, public space gets militarized, and the way people get displaced from their homes. That happens wherever these mega events uh, find purchase. And I was curious what would happen in Brazil. What I didn't expect was the largest mass movement that Brazil had seen since the fall of the dictatorship 30 years ago. I didn't expect a million people in the streets. I didn't expect people raising slogans against the World Cup in Brazil, a country that is so synonymous with soccer. And that is really what the book became. I mean, the book is like a narrative of trying to explain to a United States audience that may, might not know the first thing about Brazil beyond Pele, and explain to them why in Brazil, this pinnacle soccer nation, people are protesting the World Cup. Yeah, let's talk about that because you go into, um, uh, you, you, I think you do a great job of, of talking about how, <clears throat> how, how soccer, we call it, um, is so intertwined with Brazilian culture and that uh, the Brazilians almost developed their, like, they... In some Identity. ways, they revolutionized the, the sport or they developed their own sort of, you can actually talk about a Brazilian style of soccer or maybe yeah. arguably you could have. Talk, talk about that. No, absolutely. I think this is the toughest thing for people outside of Brazil to really understand is, so let's start with this because it might make it make more sense. What made the United States self-conscious as a nation? Um, it was the throwing off of the British throne in the American Revolution, and it was the Civil War to abolish slavery. And then you could argue as well, you know, the civil rights movement being a, the completion in, so, in many respects of the Civil War in the smashing of Jim Crow. So that's what made the U.S. self-conscious of itself as a nation. What made Brazil self-conscious of itself as a nation? Well, it didn't, there was never a Brazilian revolution against Portuguese royalty, uh, and there was never a civil war to end slavery, even though Brazil had a slave system that dwarfed that of the United States, both in terms of its numbers and its brutality. So what made Brazil self-conscious of itself? One of it, one of the things was soccer and soccer, particularly because soccer was something that in a very racist society, soccer became a source of tremendous pride for the entire nation, precisely because it was so influenced by African and Afro-Indigenous players. And so this thing that you describe, Sam, the Brazilian style, is internationally renowned the way French cuisine. I mean, it is like a brand of a style of play that speaks to beauty and grace and, and, uh, and, and an ability the likes of which other countries only aspire to. And its roots have very much to do with influences of capoeira, that's the you know, the martial art dance that was that, that slaves in Brazil started as a way to disguise rebellions. And it also had to do with the fact that in a country that that abolished slavery but still had this tremendous legacy of white supremacy, uh, black and brown players made every effort 
not to touch their opponents when they played soccer, particularly if their opponents were white. So this effort to actually avoid physical contact was something that soccer had never really seen before. Mm. And it, you know, you need rhythm, you need balance, you need all kinds of certain abilities that the game had yet to see. So that's Brazilian soccer. And one of the reasons why I think that there are these protests today is that, and this shocks people to hear this, but that Brazilians are becoming alienated from this sport that they love precisely because Brazilian soccer has become just another commodity for export branding and people can take, there is, there isn't public space to play like there used to be. People can't afford to go into the stadium to see the world cup. And I think that there's this, this anger that exists because people feel alienated from this thing that's so precious to them. Let's talk about those two aspects of the, 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 the lack of public space, the public space that has been essentially, in, in many respects, privatized, uh, yeah. and, and the, the changes to uh, the stadium where uh, the World Cup will take place. But let's, before we get there, just tell us, you know, who is FIFA? And um, these protests really started over a year ago, I guess now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Talk about who FIFA is and, and, and why the protests were so surprising in the context of what has happened in Brazil in terms of, of their economy. No, absolutely. I mean, FIFA, as it's known, FIFA. is yeah, it's the, 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 the international rulemaking governing body of soccer. It's one of the most cloistered and secretive societies um, in the world, and it is an absolute never-ending cavalcade of scandal and corruption and, and all the rest of it. And FIFA uh, was very excited to bring the, the World Cup to Brazil precisely because of the promises that Brazil made. I mean, Brazil, at the, at when they won the World Cup uh, with the then-President Lula and Pele by his side, um, made promises to build new stadiums, build, as they say, FIFA-quality stadiums, and they made promises to do all kinds of infrastructure, VIP treatment, everything that FIFA loves to hear. And that's why this World Cup is going to be more expensive than the previous three combined, with a price tag that keeps going higher and higher. Wow. Now, yeah. Now, th- now what's happened, though, is that people are in the streets saying, using that slogan about FIFA quality stadiums and saying, well, we want FIFA quality wages. We want FIFA quality hospitals. And one of the problems that FIFA has, first of all, there's this, this anger in Brazil because FIFA is seen as, as yet another European plunderer coming into the country and, 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 making their, and making their hay. The other thing is that the Brazilian economy has slowed down in the last several years. FIFA doesn't care about that. I mean, this is when FIFA gets really gangster, Sam. Like, I'm sure you've seen the movie Goodfellas. If you remember the scene where Henry Hill does the thing about, you know, bleep you, pay me, bleep you, pay me. It's like, oh, your wife is sick, bleep you, pay me. Oh, you're having troubles, bleep you, pay me. That's what happens to FIFA. So Brazil says, hey, uh, there are protests in the country. FIFA says, bleep you, pay me. Brazil says, hey, maybe we shouldn't build all new stadiums. Maybe we should use some of the ones we have, bleep you, pay me. And this is what's so interesting about what this moment, Sam, is that FIFA, which has always been, you know, Eduardo Galeano, the great Latin American writer, described them as invisible dictators. They're really being dragged into the light uh, with these protests, and that's what makes this moment, I think, very historic. There's there's a quality of uh, of FIFA that is sort of like what what we understand the sort of the, what the World Bank was doing for a long time, right? I mean, sort of just oh yeah, leveraging and um, uh, uh, sort of supposedly this is I mean. Uh, and and you call it, I think, a, a Trojan horse for for neoliberal assaults. In other words, yeah, a neoliberal Trojan horse. Yeah, t- I mean, tell t- tell us what that means because there's all these promises that come, and 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 the this is analogous to, hey, we're going to build a stadium downtown, and we're going to do it with taxpayer mm-hmm. monies, and it's gonna everybody's going to b- benefit. And um, so uh, talk about like what what FIFA has come in and done, and what. We should say uh, Lula and Dilma as well, uh, Socialist Workers yeah. Party, um, have, have promised these guys. Yeah, I mean, first of all, this is another reason why I think American audiences uh, sh- should be paying close attention to what's happening, because you look at the Rust Belt of the United States, you know, Cleveland, Detroit, Milwaukee, where you have these new publicly funded stadiums with all these promises, 
yet what do they end up creating? Well, they end up being these huge give backs to the wealthy. It ends up being these monuments to corporate welfare. And they end up actually adding to wealth inequality and, and, and class stratification in the United States. Um, TIFA operates under a very sort of similar way, except it's written much larger, especially with something like the World Cup, because it encompasses the entire country. And please keep in mind, Brazil is bigger than the continental United States. So you have FIFA coming in here and laying down dictatorial edicts to a country that only with uh, overthrew their own dictatorship 30 years ago. And they're coming in and, and, and dictatorially saying where money needs to spend, what kind of security needs to happen. There need to be drones flying overhead. There need to be a thousand street cameras in, in Rio alone. And, and putting down, like, like really their foot down uh, on the necks of the country itself. Now, yes, that neoliberal Trojan horse, I mean, that's because when FIFA comes in, then the government, in this case, as you mentioned, the Workers' Party, uh, they push through a lot of projects and objectives that they otherwise would never be able to get away with. But they can do so, or at least attempt to do so. They're getting called on it right now. But they do so Trojan horse style because people are either so excited by the World Cup or, or the nationalism of hosting this international event that people who would otherwise protest don't say a word. And I saw this with my own eyes in South Africa. And the protests in South Africa only happened after the World Cup ended in 2010. Everybody went home and the bill came due. This time we're seeing it in advance. Now, you mentioned the Workers' Party. And, I mean, you know, for years, you know, Lula has been called, you know, by the business press, you know, the IMF's favorite president. And a lot of this story has to do with what the United States did um, in the wars and occupations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Because while George W. Bush is spending a trillion dollars on these occupations, where was the money of the world being parked? It was being parked in the Brazilian stock market, uh, which went up over like 600% over the course of the decade. When the 2008 recession happened, Lula was asked about it, and he said, well, what recession? That's Bush's recession. That has nothing to do with Brazil. I mean, not even a hiccup. And they really thought that they could ride this kind of like, like the, the commodities boom and uh, the discovery of oil and the influx of all this foreign cash. They thought they could ride it to also hosting the World Cup and the Olympics back-to-back, -back, and that would be this huge showcase for the country. But there's only one problem, Sam, is that economies do slow down. <laughs> Right. And it's with the slowdown uh, and everybody's raised expectations for what the World Cup and the Olympics would bring where we end up at this moment. I mean, you you refer to this as um, uh, as opposed or maybe not as opposed, but as a almost like a, a like a compliment to the to the notion of uh, the shock doctrine of disaster capitalism. Uh, as celebration capitalism, that um, all these, mm -hmm. uh, all of these, the, the, this privatization, the, the 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 security cameras, all these things sort of come in in a moment of national pride and euphoria and high hopes, and uh, mm -hmm. then they still are there after the fact. Yeah, and I, I'll never forget hearing a sheriff in a, a, a in a town outside of London. Um, or some law enforcement official. Like, I asked him what would happen to the, to the Olympic street cameras that were put up just for the 2012 games, and he said to me, well, it's not like we can just put them back in the box, can we? So it becomes like this mission creep thing where it's it's like it's very hard to put that wine back in the bottle. Um, but I actually, I got to have the good fortune to speak to Naomi Klein about this uh, very issue. You know, she's the author of The Shock Doctrine and talks about the ways in which natural disasters from Katrina to the tsunami in Southeast Asia um, are used to put on neoliberal shock reforms. And, and we both saw these similarities. Like, it's not as extreme as a post-tsunami shock reform. But what it is, is it's still very effective. And it also allows... Uh, big business, the government, uh, the oligarchs in Brazil's case, to manage the shock therapy much more, in their mind, rationally. Because what are you going to do, sit around and wait for the next tsunami? I mean, if, if you're looking at this prime Rio real estate and you want to grab it from the people who live there in the favelas, uh, the poorest communities, what do you do? I mean, getting a major sporting event is a terrifically 
and ruthlessly effective pretext for pursuing some of these same reforms. Let, let's talk about uh, some of the, the, these exclusion zones. What, what, what are those? Oh, man. I mean, the, the exclusion zones, they're, they're creating areas that are very stratified by class, particularly in Rio and Sao Paulo, um, around the stadium uh, for purposes of security. Uh, which is, I can't say, this is the craziest thing, is that they're, they're, the, the game's in Brazil, and they're creating a World Cup that Brazilians are largely not going to attend. And they're actually creating these huge zones. They say they're doing it to ward against terrorists, and sometimes they say they're doing it to ward against protesters. Um, those words, by the way, in Brazil used very interchangeably. And they're even passing a law, like they're trying to pass a law that for the course of the World Cup, protesting would be an act akin to terrorism. Mm. Which, once again, for people, that's a nasty echo of the dictatorship that they just got rid of um, less than 30 years ago. So, but, but to bring it back to the exclusion zone, um, here's a little compare and contrast. Um, when the finals of the 1950 World Cup, which were played in Rio, uh, were at the Maracana, the, the, their, their tremendous stadium, uh, 225,000 people were there in the stadium. And there's roughly one-tenth of the city of Rio uh, was in attendance that day. Uh, now, not only has the Maracanã been whittled down, so it only seats 75,000 people, because they took out the open seating at the top and replaced it with uh, these luxury boxes. But now, of course, because of these exclusion zones, um, you know, you're not even going to go anyway. Um, if you're just a regular uh, karaoke, a regular person who lives in Rio. I mean, in, in some way, it, 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 it really is, seems to be destroying that relationship between Brazilians and soccer. I mean, not just the, the sort of, mm -hmm. but I mean, it, it, it's, it's, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, over the years, of course, we, we've seen this in sort of baseball stadiums where you like the bleachers, which used to be the way that like, you know, you could take, uh, you could take your kids to a game and it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't cost you a week's salary, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, is gone. This is the, the same dynamic. Well, I'm feeling this because I just took my son to his first Orioles game. And when I saw that hot dogs were nine bucks, right? I mean, I almost fell over. It's like a nine dollar hot dog. I mean, it's like, how are you supposed to, you know, raise your kids on, on some of those same traditions and have some of those same moments if it's so prohibitive cost wise it's, it's just a mess um but this is it, it is a very similar compare and contrast and it has to do with who sports is for it also has to do with how sports are funded in the 21st century because if the, if the main funding of sports is now sweetheart cable deals and corporate welfare and these luxury boxes well then there's very little dependence of the guardians of sport um, on working class fans. I mean, so because it's not like the owners when you and I were kids, Sam, were, were nicer people, but they needed our butts in the seats if they were going to make some money. Right. And th they don't really need our butts in the seats anymore. I mean, they need it more for anything for scenery because it would be very embarrassing. Like if you have a World Series game, for example, and the stadium's only half filled. So like they do need they need us. But they need us to be more part of the show than they need us for their financial well-being. Let's let's talk a little bit about these World Cup courts too, because this is another thing that you just wonder what will remain. I mean, I you know, the, the this the, this dynamic of the development of like these security measures and these sort of extrajudicial uh, measures mm -hmm. just you know it, it, it just reminds me a little bit of what was developed when we had the RNC in uh, New York City in 2004 mm -hmm. and, the, and and it's sort of like the the things like the kettling nets and the free speech zones and all of that which then we start to see become just not extraordinary uh, measures but daily measures, you know, uh, when we saw it, obviously, with Occupy, but we see it now at any type of event, this idea of, of cordoning off people and, and kettling them. And these World Cup courts, th that just strikes me as something that that's not going to go away. But d describe what those are, right. because it's sort of stunning. Right, right. I mean, I'm, I'm no expert on the courts, but the main point of the World Cup courts are they're setting up a, a judicial process that can basically assembly line people who are arrested, either in protest. They say it's also to guard against fights. And 
but they want to be able to do basically mass convictions uh, for the purposes of getting people off of the streets. And, yeah, no, that is very frightening. I mean, it's very frightening when a stadium is built in the Amazon that will likely never be used after this World Cup, and the politician says, well, it can be used as an open-air prison processing center. Uh, you know, th- these, are, these are scary things, and, it's, uh, and this, this is part of the whole neoliberal Trojan horse idea, because if they just said openly, it's like, hey, we're going to build a mass prison processing center, we're going to start a mass conviction process as well with these new special courts, then people would be like, hell no. But when you do it because you say you're planning for the World Cup, you have a more, a much greater chance of pushing it through. And it's frankly, it's going to be up to the popular movements to see that they don't. And so what happens now with the Olympics coming in in 2016? I mean, will they use these facilities theoretically, or are we going to see a whole nother round of this? Oh, you're going to see a whole nother round because the, the demands for, I mean, it's so weird because for some reason the Olympics still hold on to this notion that they can only be in one city in a country. So it's like, Everything is going to be centered on Rio for the next two years. And they're going to need a set of facilities, uh, the likes of which uh, this, uh, the World Cup just doesn't cover, like for the specific events. And you're already seeing that level of construction take place in Rio. There are these, and I, and I talk about this in the book, but there are like these big signs all over that, that speak in very, like, very powerful uh, lettering about how an area is going to look and and all all with like these weird slogans on top too. It's like it's a little, little too Orwellian even for Orwell. Like or like because the slogan of the country is order and progress, and you know which is in and of itself you know sort of makes your skin crawl a little bit. But but then like for, for like they do these construction projects where they're tearing down the favelas and they'll put on top of it like. Like, this is what we mean by order and progress, or the future of order and progress. Um, you know, really associating order and progress with dispossession and poverty. And, and Rio, um, you know, I know that um, uh, under Lula, at least, there was a lot of sort of um, uh, attempts to deal with wealth inequality. It didn't hold so well in Rio, did it? No, and it, it actually... I mean, Lula and Dilma, they've made some serious accomplishments on two questions. One is um, inequality, and the other um, is extreme poverty, like starvation level poverty. But the one place where it had less purchase than anywhere else was Rio. Rio was the one place in Brazil where inequality actually got worse um, in the Lula-Dilma years. And the reason for that is it's going to sound very familiar to maybe a lot of your listeners, particularly those in the New York City area. But the main reason it didn't hold purchase in in Rio was because of real estate, uh, because of gentrification, because of, I mean, it's it's now more expensive to live in Rio than it is to live in the Bay Area of the United States. I mean, it's like you could have a much more affordable life living in uh, Brooklyn Heights than you can living in Rio. I mean, it's just gotten prohibitively expensive um, partially because real estate in Rio was stagnant for 30 years, and then starting in 2007, just a speculative boom blew up. And that meant people's eyes got on the favelas, which are largely located on hills, and the World Cup and the Olympics provide a hell of a pretext to go after that land. And because you know, this is, has to be said so people understand, like the real estate interests and concerns in Brazil are like the oil industry in the United States big, powerful, ruthless, and politically connected. So, uh, and, and let's talk a little bit about the protests, because these were going on, uh, uh, I mean, I think almost to the year you wrote a piece, I think it was in The Nation, about the protests that were taking place then. Uh, and they, they, they really have, have, have continued more or less unabated. Yeah, they, they've gotten more uh, radical and direct action-oriented. Um, what in what in 2013 was masses of people coming into the streets in 2014 is seen more in land occupations um, and a lot of wildcat strikes. Um, that that means strikes that are not done with the approval of the official union leadership, and that's because a lot of the union leadership is connected to the workers' part. So you've had, uh, but when bus drivers go on wildcat strikes in Sao Paulo, that means 
I mean, Sao Paulo is the third largest city in the world. I mean, so you're talking like, I mean, incredibly dramatic photos, too, of two and a half million people um, stranded and, and you know, flooding the escalators to get into uh, the underground subway system. And in other words, a very effective transportation strike. And you've seen this also with uh, World Cup security guards, uh, teachers, and uh, firefighters, police, and the slogan that they share is they say, we want FIFA quality wages. And so what are their chances? And we should add, too, that even even Pele, I mean, I you know, um, I'm of the age uh, where, you know, when I grew up, Pele was synonymous with soccer i mean it was the cosmos right and uh um and uh i can't remember what we had in uh, massachusetts i think it was the revolution or whatever it was but um uh, pele was was huge not a, a political figure like you said he, he was standing with lula when they announced uh the world cup but he has come out uh and, and begun to criticize this yeah Oh, uh, and this is like, like I write, I wrote this the other week. Uh, this is like Nike, like Michael Jordan criticizing Nike sweatshops. I mean, because it's not just Pele taking a political stand, which is kind of bizarre enough, but it's also, uh, Pele, uh, speaking out against the, the spending priorities of the world cup. And, you know, I've been asked by folks like, do I think Pele is just being opportunistic because he took a lot of heat last year for criticizing the protests? Um, and our response is like, it doesn't really matter whether it's just opportunism or whether he really feels this in his heart. It just says something about how entrenched the dissatisfaction is that even Pele is saying something. So, so you know, and I think, um, uh, you know, we... We end all our conversations in this way, I mean, because um, I know you're a huge sports fan. But I mean, what what do people who uh, are going to go and uh, go down to the local bar or uh, watch the the World Cup at home or, you know, I don't know. I guess people obviously uh, it's designed for people to be traveling to Brazil from outside of the country. I mean, what what should the response be? Well, that's the right question. I mean, first and foremost, I mean, this is a global event. Um, nothing unites global eyes quite like the World Cup. And, I mean, for people to want to be a part of that, to feel that energy is beyond understandable. And I don't think it's, I would never moralize to somebody who wanted to enjoy what the, the majesty of the World Cup. I would ask people, though, to really stay on your computer and listen to what's happening off the field because there there are likely to be several solidarity calls over the course of the World Cup for people to go to the Brazilian embassy and protest, because people who protest in Brazil, they're going to get gassed, they're going to get shot at. Um, and the if Brazil if Brazil's uh, military police feel like the whole world is watching, they're less likely to pursue uh, brutal ends to stop these protests. So there's a lot people can do. I mean, just but be aware of what's happening. Take the time to, to take 10 seconds to do a Google search and see if there are any calls that have come out of Brazil to go to the local embassy. And then if they do, take 20 minutes, bring a sign, and tell police hands off. Because what we should be fighting for in the United States is making sure that there is space in Brazil for people who want to protest to be able to do so. And 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 also, uh, people. I think I would add should understand this dynamic because um, this is how oh, it's yeah. playing out in Brazil. But this is a dynamic we see, like you say, uh, in cities across the country, uh, in this country, and obviously in, across the world. But um, in this country, we see it all the time. Maybe not in the exact um, sa- same scope or, or scale, but this dynamic mm-hmm. is one that people really have to become aware of more and uh you're doing a great job oh, of educating absolutely. people about it or, or, to, or to put another way if you protest in solidarity with brazil it's not an act of charity it truly is an act of solidarity indeed dave zyron author of brazil's dance with the devil the world cup the olympics and the fight for democracy we'll put a link at majority.fm thanks so much for your time today dave uh really well, thank you it. sam